says, he is mine. He is mine. Jesus, I know he is mine. Well, we bless the Lord and so glad you've joined us here for your divine appointment, which is the media ministry of the Divine Jackson Indian Ministries. I'm Dr. Jackson. Glad you're here for Thursday school, which is Sunday school on Thursday. What a privilege, what a privilege it is for us to gather and study the word of God together. We want you to know these recordings are available on our various social media platforms, 24 hours a day on demand. And will you tell at least two people this week about Thursday school? We would appreciate that. Glory to God. Uh, and we bless the Lord for the privilege today to study his word on the fourth Sunday of August, August the 25th, 2024. And we're continuing in the book of Titus chapter three, verses three through 11. And it's talking about the washing of regeneration and a phenomenal lesson. I hope you have pen and paper and you're ready. You might need to take a couple of screenshots. We have some wonderful things for you on today. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your sweet word. Ah, your word is sweet. <laughs> Teach it to us, transform us, make us better. Thank you for my brothers, sisters, and friends that have joined us. Lord, we're gathered around your table. Feed us bread from heaven. We pray in Jesus' name and amen. Oh, glory to God. Well, the book of Titus chapter three, verses three through 11, and I'm reading in the English Standard Version. The word of God says, for we ourselves were once, and he begins a list here of five things and they have changed actually six things and there's been a change. Here they are. We were once foolish, but God of course is calling us now to be wise. Glory to God. Number two, we were disobedient, but God is calling us now to be obedient to him by the spirit. Number three, we had been led astray, but now God is calling us back to follow him. Don't follow man, don't follow self, and don't follow the devil. Oh, glory to God. Ah, and number four, we were slaves to various passions and pleasures. The Lord's not calling us to slavery, to sin anymore, as we talked about last week. But God is calling us now to be slaves of righteousness, followers, and dedicated to the great king. Glory to God. Then number four, uh, number five, we were passing our days. And this phrase suggests time being squandered. We were losing time. Time should be handled like money, not just spent so that once it's gone, it's gone, but it should be invested so that there is a return. So our time should be used wisely. Uh, the scripture speaks about redeeming the time. In fact, even in the Old Testament, in uh, the book of Psalms uh, 90 and number 12, it says, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. We should consider the fact that life is brief, the brevity of life, and life being brief, we only have a certain amount of days, only a certain amount of time, we should be investing it wisely. Glory to God. So there's a return that brings glory to God. So that was passing our days. And then um, uh, number six, how were they spent? In malice, oh, which is hatred. And instead we're called that we're supposed to love. And it was in envy. We're not supposed to be envious of people. We're supposed to be compassionate and generous, not trying to be angry that somebody else has something envious, but we're trying to give them more. Oh, what a change in the mindset. Glory to God. Malice and envy. And look at two, these other two things. We were hated by others. Well, we're supposed to live a life. Some people are going to be haters, but overall, we're supposed to live a life that is inspirational to others. The Bible says provoking one another to good works. We're supposed to live a life that's an example, that is instructive. People are learning and profiting by our lives. Amen. So that we're not inciting them to hate us. If they hate us, let it be on them and not how we live. And we basically bought the hatred. Oh, glory to God. <laughs> Hated by others. And look at this. 
and we were hating one another. We were hated by others and we were hating too. God didn't call us to hate, he called us to love. In fact, we are supposed to love all men. And of course, there's a special love for the household of faith. Jesus went on to say in St. John 13 and 35, by this shall all men know you're my disciples because you have love one to another. Our, our love for each other is to compel people. I've got to investigate this thing about Christianity and I want to be one of them. Glory to God. So what a way that he opens out the way we were. Hallelujah. And now we know how the Lord wants us to be. Glory to God. Look at verse four. It says, but when the goodness and loving kindness, wow, isn't that precious? His goodness and his loving kindness of God, our Savior appeared because the Savior is God. Help me shout amen. When those things appeared, his goodness and his loving kindness, it resulted in something. Look at verse five. He saved us. Oh, bless his name. He saved us. How many of the Lord has saved you? Wave at me. Oh, glory to God. He saved us. And it's not because of works done by us in righteousness. That's not how we got saved. We are to do works of righteousness. But that's not what saved us. Look what happened. It was according to his own mercy. Oh, bless his name. By the two things happened. Three things happened. The washing of regeneration. There is a washing that occurs because sin has stained us and that's got to be washed away. And that washing is connected with the new birth, regeneration. The root word in regeneration is G-E-N-E, -E, which is gene. Our genes are part of our DNA. Regeneration is the new birth, new DNA, because we have a new father. Oh, we're not genetically in the spirit realm who we used to be. Our old father's gone and we have a new dad. We are regenerated, brand new. And that's why it's called being born again. That refers to the new birth. And then it goes on to say, and the renewal of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Now, the new birth made us inside spiritually new, instantaneously at salvation, regeneration. But then the renewal that the Holy Spirit does is ongoing. Glory to God. And we need both of those. First Corinthians, Second Corinthians 5 and 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, look, all things are made new. The new birth inside is instantaneous. So we're brand new spiritual babes. But now that babe has to learn the way of the Lord and that ongoing work of the Spirit of God in our life, sanctification and so on. That is the renewal that happens by the Spirit. Oh, glory to God. How many are glad to be born again? and in the process of renewal, bless his name. This is important. And this same Holy Spirit who's doing this renewal, look at verse six. It says, whom he poured out, not sprinkled, not a drop or two, but he poured out on us how richly through Jesus Christ our sin. So now there's this great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And aren't we glad about it, that the Lord is richly giving us of his spirit? This was prophetically said of Joel in chapter two, beginning in verse 28. And the fulfillment began in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost. Let's look at Acts chapter two, verses 16 through 18, the Holy Spirit outpouring. So in these last days, here's what we see. But this is what Apostle uh, Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost. He's been filled with the Holy Spirit. Jews from all over the world were there and he's preaching. He says, but this that you're looking at, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And what did Joel say? And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out, not drop, I'm gonna pour out my spirit on all flesh. Oh, glory to God. 
Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And all my men servants and all my maiden uh, maid servants, I will pour out my spirit. I'm pouring it out in those days, and they shall prophesy. Look at this, male and female, young and old. I'm pouring it out. Hallelujah. And this this term here about the men servants and the maid servants. On the one hand, we're all servants of the Lord. On the other hand, others may take it that it includes the poor, right? Because they were often those who were servants, right? The general principle is that we're all servants of God. But that other element, as the Lord is specifying here, I'm pouring out my spirit on all flesh. And so he begins to go through these uh, delineations to let us know, indeed, it's for all flesh, all people. Amen. Glory to God. Pouring out my spirit, and this is rich, that it's in great measure. It is the activity of the Holy Spirit, not of a few drops, but of this outpouring. It is the flood of the Spirit, that it is allowed to freely flow in the lives of the believers. Oh, glory to God. John chapter 7 describes that the Spirit of God will be like a well of water flowing in us. That's the whole idea, the flow, the outpouring. Glory to God. And this flow whereby we see the new creation and the new life on full display and in full operation. We have to let the Holy Spirit flow. Let him rule and reign. We are warned against doing the opposite there in uh, First Thessalonians, what is it, 5 and 19, which says quench not the spirit. Don't quench, don't limit the spirit's work in our life because he needs to flow. Glory to God. You don't need the Lord to pour out if there's not going to be opportunity for there to be a flowing of what God is outpouring. Glory to God. Disobedience limits the activity of the Spirit in our lives because the Spirit of God wants to flow, wants to be active. But if we're disobedient and resistant, then what the Spirit can do through us will be limited. Uh, we don't want that. Glory to God. Look at verse 7. It says, so being justified by His grace. Justified means being made right with God. The courtroom scene, the sinner is guilty. God is the righteous judge. But the sinner walks in, yes, I'm guilty. But Jesus paid my price. I'm coming in this court in his name. So when we come in the name of Jesus, Jesus' payment covers us, and the sinner is made right with the court. God slams down the gavel and says, not guilty. And we're made free because we're justified. Made right with God because we accepted what Jesus did on our behalf. And we follow Jesus and live for him. Glory to God. So that being justified, by his grace, undeserved faith, we might become heirs, ah, according to the hope of eternal life. We're back to that word hope all through this whole series. This hope of eternal life is key because we've seen the power of hope in our lives. First John 3 and 3 lets us know because of the hope of eternal life, it'll cause us to purify ourselves. Real hope, it makes a difference in the life. Bible said it will cause us to purify ourselves even as he is pure. And we're heirs of many things, but this verse is talking about one of them, which is eternal life. We got to sit with that a moment. Precious believers, saints of God, we have eternal life. <laughs> All glory to God. Help me shout amen. We have eternal life. Glory to God. Look at verse 8. The saying is trustworthy, the apostle says, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed, right, the believer, those who have believed in God may be careful to what? Devote themselves to good works. This is where we're talking about eternal life. You got this great hope of eternal life. It's going to do something. It's going to cause you to purify yourself and give yourself to good works a lifestyle of righteousness. Lifestyle matters. 
it matters. This subject is about the washing of regeneration. If we're going to be just like we were before, what do we need to be washed for? If we're going to be like we were before, that's impossible because we've been regened. We got a new dad, new DNA, brand new. So devote themselves, the apostle is teaching, to a life of good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Our lifestyle matters. Lifestyle always matters. People say, God's in my heart and whatever. If he's really on the inward, he will show on the outside because we're called to a lifestyle to bless others because we live for the sake of others as well, not just ourselves. Glory to God. Look at verse nine. Now here comes some warnings, very powerful. He says uh, to Titus, avoid foolish controversies. And he runs through a list of things. This first one is, there are some persons who love discussions for the sake of discussions. They just bring up a controversy for the sake of doing so. Sometimes it's for them to appear intelligent. Sometimes it's out of their arrogance. There are some people, and it's, a, it's an unclean spirit, they love chaos and confusion. If things are peaceable and smooth, they want there to be a disturbance. So they create controversy where there need not be any. Apostle Paul says, listen, uh, Titus, don't let yourself get caught up in a foolish controversy, which is an endless discussion that profits no one, goes nowhere. Have you ever been in a discussion where points are being made, progress is being made, you're on your way to clarity and to an understanding. Somebody even gets up and gives a clear answer. And after that clear answer that clears the air, someone gets up and asks a question that's already been answered. To turn the whole discussion, you start the whole thing again. They're often not paying attention and other times don't want there to be clarity. That's of the enemy. God is not the author of confusion but of peace. Oh, glory to God. Titus, be careful that you not get caught up in these endless discussions. Genealogies. Now, the Jews, now notice in these churches, they had both Jews and Gentiles. Sometimes the Jews would get into their literal genealogies, as we see, for example, many times in the Old Testament, the list of so-and-so begat so-and-so, or this person fathered this one, this one fathered this one. And many of the Jews could trace their heritage, their genealogy, all the way back to David, King David, some all the way back, uh, even earlier, perhaps to Abraham himself. They know their heritage. Well, the Gentiles did. Most cultures of the world don't know their genealogies and their heritage like the Jews. And some Jews used it as an opportunity to show a superiority over their Gentile brethren and to cause a schism, division in the body of Christ. And it was out of an arrogant attitude. Others with the genealogies, there was a group of people called the Gnostics, not the agnostics, but the Gnostics, who had this whole belief that there was a divine or divine spark, sometimes is the term used, that's in every human. And as you chase knowledge, you progressively grow, and even perhaps an element in there that not only that man goes back to his original state by the by means of knowledge, but maybe that man can even be a little bit of a god himself. So this whole twisted up uh, belief system was entangled with this genealogy business. And uh, uh, Paul telling Titus, listen, don't let them get you entangled up in all of these endless genealogies either. Yes, we're seed of Abraham, yes. Many of us can trace our heritage back many, many, many generations, but that doesn't make us superior to the Gentiles. We're not going to be making our brothers and sisters try to feel bad to make ourselves look like we're something great, amen, and divide the body. No, it's one body in Christ Jesus. At salvation, Jew and Gentile are one, amen. So don't get caught up in that. And then look at the next one. Dissensions and quarrels about the law. Some people were continuously Pick this law out of the Old Testament. Pick that law of the Old Testament. Big discussion back and forth. Well, the Jews had overall, not all, but overall, they'd been unfaithful to the law all along. That was the problem Moses had with them, Joshua had with them. 
That's why Joshua even had to say, listen, you choose today who you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we're serving the Lord. You all can serve it, serving these idol gods or whatever. You all make up your mind. All through the generations, the times of the judges, the times of the kings, they had revival and they came back to the God of heaven. Then they would serve idol gods and back to the God of heaven and, and then and back to idol gods. They were faithful to the law through the generations. And the, and the Pharisees and the scribes and many of them unfaithful, Jesus had just told them face to face, you hypocrites, not saying every single one of them, but as a group, you're hypocrites. So they hadn't been faithful already. Now you want to entangle the Gentiles in this and get into quarrels with your fellow Jewish brethren and get off the real subject, which is get the gospel to the whole world. These things get ministries derailed and all focus. Paul's telling Titus, don't let any of this madness get you off the target, which is that Jesus Christ died, he was crucified, he died, he buried, he rose, and he's coming back again. Oh, bless his name. Look at all this. Con foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law. Why? For they are unprofitable and worthless. Wow. These discussions, darlings, can be absolutely endless. All right. What about an hour a day? It may not be these very things. It may not be genealogies. Maybe an hour very day. Many people on doctrinal points. Some doctrinal things we can, as was well said, we can debate, but we won't divide. You believe this. I believe this. Both of them are within the confines of Holy Scripture. You believe the focus is this, I believe the focus is this, or you believe the interpretation is this, I believe that. But both of those are biblical. So we have a difference of opinion, but we don't have to divide because both of them have a sound biblical basis of rightly dividing the truth. Amen. However, if someone has a belief system that is unbiblical, on that we have to divide. Now, I can't embrace that. That is unbiblical. There's a difference between those two. And sometimes people continuously discuss doctrinal issues, just like here. There were the controversy, the genealogies, the dissension and quarrels about the law that keep division, chaos, and confusion. You discourage particularly new believers and you confuse those that are just hungry for God. They're not believers yet. And you cause chaos in the church. It's not to be so. Oh, blessed be God. It's not God's will. So let's look at, precious ones, some of the essentials of the faith. Over these, if somebody does not accept these, we have to divide. We have to say, I can't embrace that. It's unbiblical. But we want to know what are those essentials of the faith. And I'm saying this is every single one of them. These, all of these, though, are essentials of the faith. We need to know the difference. So we know over what to debate, disagree, but we're not disagreeable versus other things over which we debate it and we have to divide because it is against the essentials of the gospel. Are you with me? Let's look at some of these essentials of our faith. Number one, the deity of Jesus. Deity means Jesus, the man, is God. Oh, yes, he is. Emmanuel was said at his birth. His name is called Emmanuel, which is God with us. God took on human form. Jesus is God. We have uh, uh, multiple of uh, uh, scriptures. One of them, Jesus in St. John chapter six was talking to the people and he said, before Abraham was, I am. That And they heard that and they were ready to take up stones to stone him for blasphemy because when he said, I am, he was saying he was God. That's the same I am that God said in uh, the book of Genesis when he, excuse me, not that Genesis, in the book of Exodus chapter 3, I believe verse 14, when the Lord spoke out of the burning bush to Moses and was calling Moses to minister. And Moses says, when they asked me who sent me, whom shall I say sent me? God said, I am that I am. And I am that I am is where we get the glorious sacred name, Yahweh. We talked about that a week or so ago. I am, that's God's name. And Jesus 
in John 6 said, I am. That's why they wanted to stone him because he said, I'm God. Another time uh, when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, they came to arrest him. Oh, glory to God. And so the temple, all those uh, officers there, they came to arrest him. And, they, and Jesus said, whom seek ye? They said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said, I am under the power of saying I am, that same I am that I am from uh, the uh, call of Moses. When Jesus said that, the Bible said they fell out. They fell back at the word I am. Jesus said, I'm God. And uh, when he was speaking to the, so many other things, but he was speaking to the woman uh, of Samaria uh, in chapter four. She says, you know, we're looking for a Messiah. So Jesus said, I'm he. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Jesus said, I am the one. And multiple scriptures talk about Jesus and God right here in our lesson. The Savior is God. Jesus is God. And leading with that, the virgin birth. I need to go uh, more rapidly so we don't spend too much time. But the virgin birth, we want to hold on to this, darling. Jesus was not Joseph's son. Because if Jesus was Joseph's son, then that means that Jesus would be a son of Adam. And all of Adam's sons and daughters, all of his children are sinners. And so was Joseph. So if Joseph was Jesus' father, Jesus is a sinner too. And if Jesus is a sinner, he can't be the savior because the savior has to be sinless. Jesus is not Joseph's son. Jesus is not Adam's son. Jesus is the son of God. Oh, bless his name. That's why the angel Gabriel told Mary, Mary, the spirit of God is just going to put him in your womb. Jesus is the son of God. The next is the sinless life. Because, of course, the Savior has to, be, has to be sinless. If the Savior is a sinner, he's not dying for our sins. He's dying for his own. So the Savior has to be sinless. Oh, glory to God. Can somebody shout with me? <laughs> the atoning death. He didn't just die. People die every day. But his death was atoning. It was substitutionary. He died in our place. Another term is vicarious. He died on behalf of those that had to die, which are the sinners. The sinless one, the Bible says, he became sin for us. Hung on the cross and took the penalty that was ours. Sinless life, atoning death. Now, next one is bodily resurrection. It wasn't an emotional resurrection, a spiritual resurrection. Jesus bodily got up. The Bible says it's the first fruits of them that slept. We read over there in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, all about the resurrection and various other passages talk about. He had to have bodily got up because if Jesus didn't bodily get up, if there was no bodily resurrection of him and he's the first fruits, then we're not getting up either. <laughs> oh, but he got up. Oh, glory to God. Bodily resurrection. Jesus even told uh, Thomas, Thomas, you're doubting. Come over here. Look at the hole in my side and the hole in my hand. Bodily resurrection. They saw him. They handled him. They touched him. He ate with them. Uh, the, the two on the road for Emmaus, he sat and he ate with them. And he ate with his disciples. And Jesus said, listen, a spirit, Jesus let him know I'm a physical body. A spirit does not have flesh and bones like you see me have. I got flesh and I got bones. It's a physical body. Oh, glory to God. Bodily resurrection. And we're getting up to imminent return. Many people stop with the bodily resurrection. Well, the imminent return and these last three matter as well. Because if Jesus did all of this and he went back and he's not coming back, well, then it's over. It's not over. He's coming back again. Acts uh, chapter 1 and verse 8. And you should receive power that the Holy Ghost come upon you. Verse uh, 9 and 10. The angels come and say, you men of Galilee, why are you uh, gazing up? This same Jesus. Woo, help me say the same Jesus. Same Jesus that went up. He's coming back in like manner. Oh, yes, he is. He's coming back. Imminent meaning it could be at any time because those things that were, when we look at Matthew chapter 24 and various other uh, criteria for the return of the Lord, uh, those have occurred. Imminent return. Then the resurrection of all mankind. If Even if we stop at the imminent return, if we die, and that's over. Many people say when you're dead, you're done. That's a lie. 
if there really is no life after death and eternity's not real and we're not going to be raised again, then it doesn't matter how we lived because there's no life after death. Eternity doesn't exist. But eternity does exist. And there is life after death. And we will all answer to the God that made us. Everybody will be judged. The believers at the judgment seat of Christ, the lost at the great white throne judgment before the God himself, we will all be judged. The unbeliever unto, unfortunately, eternal damnation, hell, the lake of fire forever is real. I wish it was temporary and just the annihilation and didn't matter. Eternity is forever. All of us have the breath of God. The Lord breathed in Adam and that part of us is eternal. And it's going to live eternally with the Lord in heaven or it's going to die eternally in the lake of fire with the devil and the beast and the false prophet. And hell itself is going to the lake of fire. Bible says it burns with fire and brimstone forever and ever. The worm never dies. I did an in-depth study to try to see, is hell, the lake of fire, for real? Is it forever? Not just, I know it's real, but is it forever? It's forever. That's why Jesus died. If after we die, we're just annihilated, we're, we're no more. What did Jesus die for? He died because eternity is real. And if you've never made Jesus Christ your Lord, do it now, right where you are. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting. All we have to do is admit, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I've done wrong. I'm willing to admit it. I want you to forgive me. I know that Jesus died on the cross, suffered and died. He was buried, but he rose again. His suffering and death was to pay my penalty for my sin. I accept Jesus as my Savior. I leave my old life behind. I take the Lord Jesus to follow him all the days of my life. Wash me, make me clean, transform me, cause me to be born again. I believe in Jesus and I will follow him all the days of my life because he's risen from the dead and he's alive. Just receive the Lord right where you are. Hospital bed, prison, walk in the street, sitting in a bar, doesn't matter. Somebody may be thinking of taking your life. Don't go! The Lord sent us on his behalf to plead with you. Don't take your life. God's got too much wonderful for you. It's not over. There's still breath in your body, so it's not too late to receive the Lord. Father, we bless you and we praise you. Receive the Lord now. Oh, glory to God. The essentials of the faith that you've received Christ as your Savior today. Please go to our website. The web address is right there at the bottom of uh, this flyer, djmd.org, djmd.org. The sinner's prayer is there. And then if you receive Christ, let us know. Contact us. Hallelujah. We would love to share some more with you. Glory to God. Join a Bible-believing church and serve the Lord. Oh, bless his name. Essentials of the faith. Essentials of the faith. Glory to God. Now, so we're aware of those that who are hard-hearted, and are not looking for truth. They're just looking for pride and chaos and to try to approve, appear to prove themselves superior. That hard-heartedness leading to a divisive spirit is a major problem. Look at verse 10. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once, and you're going to warn him then twice, look what it says, have nothing to do with them. Church discipline, darlings, is real. Matthew chapter 16 through 18. And over in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we've mentioned it before. And other areas of the scripture talk about church discipline. When someone is repeatedly, persistently, they won't repent. The church has been given guidelines by which to put them out of the fellowship. It's biblical. But we don't want to go there. When we find ourselves in error, we want to repent. We don't want to do wrong in the first place. But if we do wrong. We want to confess, repent, get right. Amen. Ah, it matters. Divisiveness is serious with God. Let's look at this. The scripture gives warnings against division. Look at this. 
in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. The Bible says, these six things the Lord hates. Now listen, anything God hates, we better hate it too. Wow, that's a strong term. You don't see very much in scripture about God hating things. He's so much of love. There's six things God hates. Yea, seven are an abomination, absolutely reprehensible to him, a reproach to him. That's abomination. Look at this. First on the list, a proud look. God resists the proud, give grace to the humble. A proud look, a lying tongue, all those lies. Hands that shed innocent blood. Look at this. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that are swift running to evil. A false witness who speaks lies. Notice lying is in the list twice. Glory to God. And look at the last one. And one who sows discord among brethren. Not a chord with the notes all make one harmonious sound, but discord, which is when there's a chaotic sound that is not harmonious. Those who sow discord amongst brethren are in the list of the things God hates. Don't be a source of discord. My, my, my. Lord, help us today. Now look at verse 11. Verse 11 says, knowing that such a person is warped, wow, which means they're twisted and perverted and bent. Wow, the evil one has twisted. People say division, no, listen, they talk about other sins, but listen, the one who sows discord, the Bible says they're warped as sin and sinful. He is self-condemned. We talked before about no condemnation, but the divisive person be warned, be warned, be warned, be warned, glory to God. Divisive persons often take lightly what they're doing, but their actions are ungodly, they're evil, and they are against God. God takes divisiveness and rebellion, which is ultimately a seed in there. God takes that very seriously, and so should we. So we must remember the church is not ours. The church belongs to God. God bless you, my brothers, sisters, and friends. Thank you so much for joining us for your divine appointment here in Thursday School class. Remember this, the God of the Bible is real. Prepare for your divine appointment with him. It's coming, it's coming. God bless you till we meet again. <laughs>